Both the three-year-old Canon EOS R5 and the quite new Nikon Z8 are two very interesting cameras for wildlife and nature photography in general. I have used both cameras quite intensively, I managed to create some great shots with each of the two cameras, but I also had some more frustrating moments with both of them. I can already tell you now there is no best camera and if you're already invested in either the Canon EOS R system or the Nikon Z system, probably you will not switch just because of some features that one of the two cameras has that the other might not. However, if you're still using a maybe a bit older DSLR and you're thinking about upgrading to the mirrorless system, maybe you're still shooting with something like a 150 to 600 millimeter uh, lens and you want to upgrade to an expensive Super Telephoto Prime, or maybe you're just starting fresh into wildlife photography, then it's important to make a decision to go for one of the two systems. And I hope that with the comparison of these two cameras, I can help you a bit making this decision. Obviously, I'm not going through the specs sheets and giving check marks for one of the two cameras. In this video, I want to report about the key differences that I experienced when using the two cameras in practice, and maybe also mention some of the differences that might seem big on paper, but I can tell you from my experiences that they really don't matter, and I really hope this video can help you. So if we look at both cameras, we can already see that there is quite of a size and also a weight difference. So the size difference is actually mainly in the height of the camera, where the Nikon is around two centimeters taller than the Canon. And which form factor you prefer comes down to personal preference and maybe also to the lens that you use. So if I shoot with my RF 100 to 500, I'm really happy that I have a small package with this R5. It still fits nicely in my hands even though I need to say I have rather small hands. Whereas if I shoot with a 600mm f4, I don't feel so much of a difference between the two cameras anymore, just because the 600mm f4 is so heavy that the extra weight and measures are not a big deal. And some people might enjoy the extra grip on the, or the bigger uh, grip, especially for the pinky on the Z8. In terms of weight, I clearly prefer the lighter body of the R5. So it weighs around 740 grams, which is similar than the Sony A1, whereas the Z8 weighs 910 grams, both with um, battery and card included. Speaking of cards, both have a dual card slot, one CF Express and one SD. Here, just from my personal experience, if you shoot wildlife, I highly recommend buying a CF Express card, even if they are a bit more expensive, but with the SD card, you will just run into buffer issues. So usually I would also not recommend to put the SD as a backup, except if you really um, yeah, are in a once in a lifetime situation maybe, or you know that you will not shoot a lot of bursts and a lot of action. Otherwise, what I do with both cameras is use the SD as an overflow, meaning if the CF Express card is full, it will switch to the SD, but usually it just shoots to the CF Express because there the buffer lasts longer and it clears much faster. Both of the cameras are kind of semi-professional to professional bodies, so they have some kind of weather and or water and dust sealing. Um, both of them have like a joystick, this shoulder display, and an in-body image stabilizer, IBIS, but there are also some differences. For example, if we look at the side of the camera, the Nikon Z8 features a full HDMI port, whereas the R5 only has this tiny micro HDMI that I really yeah, grew to hate over the last couple of months to years. Otherwise, the ports are quite similar. I think you will find everything you need there. Interestingly, the Z8 has two USB ports, so you can charge and transfer at the same time. But I think for nature photography, this is not really relevant. Some other differences is that the Z8 features illuminated buttons. Again, for wildlife photography, I never used it, but for astrophotography, I sometimes wished the camera would have this. Um, on the other hand, something that I really prefer on the R5 is that it has three wheels or dials that I can use for sh setting shutter speed, ISO, and the aperture. And this makes it just much quicker in the field for me to change these parameters because I shoot manual mode all the time. 
And with the set 8, it just means I need to press this little ISO button and then turn the dial, which seems a bit silly, but it really slows the whole thing a bit down. Both cameras feature a 3.2 inch screen that has around 2.1 million dots. Both are obviously also touchscreens and you can tilt them, but in a bit different ways. So the Z8 can go up, down and also up and down in the vertical position. It's quite an elaborated mechanism, whereas the R5 has in this sense a bit an easier one. So it can also be uh, facing inwards and then it's a bit more uh, protected the screen itself. You can of course just put it out normally or you can uh, tilt it also down up and also tilt it in front which can be quite nice if I'm filming myself and also for the vertical shooting I can at least look from top down. The other way is not possible but I never really needed this. So I think overall the R5 is a bit more versatile with the screen However, the Z8 features a big advantage and that is that um, if I have the screen, if I look down to the screen, I have it tilted because maybe I'm shooting some ducks and I'm in a position where even laying down I cannot reach the viewfinder because I had this sometimes that the shore was a bit steeper. I put the tripod with the camera into the water and I was looking down on the screen. Now, with the R5, the screen is next to the camera, meaning it's not on the say on the optical axis. And this makes it actually harder to locate and to track birds. Whereas on the Z8, it's perfectly on the, on the optical axis. And this really helps to more easily locate and track the birds. For me, the viewfinder is more important than the rear screen. And here the Canon has one with 5.8 million pixels and the Nikon with 3.7. And many people were complaining that 3.7 in this price class is like not acceptable or a bit disappointing. And just from real life experiences, I need to say, yes, if you compare them side by side, you see that the R5 is a bit sharper. But the Z8 still delivers a crisp image. It's easy to judge the sharpness. It's a joy using it. Um, so I have no complaints about the resolution, to be honest. And what I felt more of a difference was that the Z8 was actually a bit, is a bit bigger. It features a 0 0.8 magnification versus the 0 0.76 on the R5. And I almost felt that this difference was bigger than the difference in resolution. At least this is how I perceived it. Both viewfinders have a refresh rate of 120 Hertz. However, the Z8 has a stacked sensor and therefore offers a blackout free shooting, meaning if you take a burst of uh, pictures and you track a subject, um, you still have kind of this live feed of the, of the viewfinder, whereas on the R5 you kind of go back to a slideshow effect with 20 frames per second, which makes it harder to track the birds. It might work fine for a heron passing by or um, a buzzard that is circling in the sky, but it's really for swifts, swallows, turns, all birds that move a bit more erratically. It's much easier to follow with the Z8. So let's get to the heart of the cameras, the sensor. Both feature a 45 megapixel CMOS sensor. So it offers really plenty of detail. I was very happy with the sharpness of both cameras. In terms of noise, I had the feeling that like from 1600 ISO onwards, I felt the R5 is producing a bit cleaner results. Um, I noticed this on several shots, even though I didn't really do side-by-side -side tests, to be fair. And then I checked on several resources in the internet, for example, DP Review that luckily managed to persist and DxO Mark, and they kind of confirmed the result that the R5 is a bit better in low light, but the difference is not crazy. One thing you also hear people talk about is the kind of the colors or the image look of Nikon versus Canon. And yes, they look a bit different. Personally, I prefer how the image comes straight out of the camera from Canon. But first of all, the difference is not huge. Second, it's of course personal preference. And third, I mean, it's raw files. I'm editing them anyway. If I want to change the tone of the green from the or the yellow from the Nikon to a bit more orange, then because I find it's a bit too greenish, this is one slider in Capture One or Lightroom. And if I have this with all my files, I just put a preset, this is done in a few seconds, apply this to all fines, files and I'm fine. So personally, I think people make a big fuss about nothing. Of course, if you shoot five or six years with Canon and then you start shooting Nikon and edit the the files in the beginning it might take you a bit longer to get the colors right but 
this has nothing to do with Nikon. I had the same when I was using Sony and then switched to Canon. It got a bit getting used to the way you need to treat these files, but in the, at the end of the day, both produce very nice and pleasant files. One big difference between the two sensors is, however, that the Z8 has a stacked sensor, which means there is no rolling shutter. Um, this is very nice if you have a bird that is moving quick or even insects in flight where with a non-stacked sensor you can have some distortions in the wings or sometimes some weird uh, horizontal bending and this cannot happen with the Z8. On the other hand, I need to say that the R5 sensor is one of the fastest non-stacked sensors. So I shoot in the electronic mode like 99% of the time probably and I very rarely see a rolling shutter effect. But just using the Z8 and knowing it's a stacked sensor gives me a bit a better feeling because on some occasions I still observe rolling shutter and then it's a bit annoying. Both cameras have some mechanism to prevent dust entering the camera and ultimately the sensor when you change lenses. So when you turn them off for the R5 there is just a mechanical shutter that closes. Whereas on the Z8, since it doesn't have a mechanical shutter, it's um, a sensor shield that is going down and closing. Um, both do, this, do the trick, but what I really prefer about the Z8 is that the sensor shield is going down immediately when you shut down the camera, whereas for the R5 it takes a, two or three seconds, which is sometimes annoying if you want to change the lenses quickly and then sometimes I just change them without waiting for the sensor shield to close. I hope you can see this difference in this clip. In terms of frame rate, the R5 shoots 12 frames per second in a mechanical or first electronic shutter and 20 frames per second in the electronic shutter. If you shoot with the 12 frames per second, you are already limited to 13-bit uh, file depth or dynamic range. If you shoot 20 frames per second electronic, you are limited to 12-bit. On the Nikon, on the other hand, you have 20 frames per second, always in the electronic shutter because it has no mechanical shutter, and you have the full 14-bit. So in theory, this has an advantage in dynamic range. In practice, we need to look a bit more carefully because the way that sensors work is that they have a high dynamic range at 100 ISO or 200, and then it's continuously dropping. Sometimes they have a small peak around 400 or 800 ISO, but in general, it's dropping, meaning that for the R5, I think at 800 ISO, you're already at this 12-bit file depth. So meaning uh, having 40-bit would not really help you because the sensor cannot capture more. But in the lower ISO, when I shoot sometimes backlit, sometimes with some flares, I actually tend to go back to the mechanical or first electronic shutter on the R5 just to get a bit more dynamic range. And that's just something that is not needed on the Z8. I don't need to worry about it. And I can always continue shooting with the 20 frames per second and getting the maximum dynamic range. And speaking of backlit, the shutter is a bit different. So for the R5, both mechanic and electronic shutter, the shortest shutter speed I can put is one eight thousandths of a second. On the Z8, the electronic shutter can be set to up to 1 thousandth of a second. So meaning you have can make an image that is two stops darker with the Z8. Um, granted, most of the time we want more light in the camera, but if I shoot backlit, like I said, on a lake or river with some flares, I was actually sometimes quite happy to go at least to 10, 1 thousandth or 1 thousandth of a second. So the next question is how big is the buffer or with other words, how long can the cameras maintain this burst rate? First of all, here we need to distinguish between different file formats. So I only consider RAW, but there is three different RAW formats on the Z8 and two on the R5. On the R5, we have the normal RAW and a compressed RAW. On the Z8, we have a lossless compressed RAW. We have a high efficiency star RAW and a high efficiency RAW. So I was always used working with the high efficiency star on the Z8 and with the C RAW on the Canon. And according to Nikon, if you shoot with the high efficiency, so with the lowest RAW format, you can shoot, I think, up to 1000 pictures in a row before the camera slows down. If, I, if you use the high efficiency star, this was the one I was using, so I was doing some tests and I managed to get around 100 shots, so close to five uh, seconds of continuous shooting before the camera slowed down. It was still going on with, I didn't measure, but I would say maybe six, seven frames per second. It was not really stopping completely. Um, 
Whereas on the R5, I managed to get um, around 160 frames in a row, so around 8 seconds of continuous shooting before the camera slowed down. But then it slowed down like more noticeably. It almost it stopped for one or two seconds, continued a bit, whereas the Z8 continue, it was more continuous in this sense. I need to say with the more than 20,000 pictures I was taking with the Z8, I didn't really notice this slowdown. I'm not sure if I hit the buffer once or twice, but since it's still going reasonably fast, um, it's actually quite okay and you don't have so many action shots that last more than four or five seconds, I would say. It's just really if you have two animals fighting and you don't know if the best is yet to come or already over. For just, just like birds in flight, usually I wait until the bird is close enough, then I have a burst of maybe two or three seconds and that's it. Nevertheless, I wanted to do a test not only how long does it take until the camera slows down, but if you have like a fighting scene that lasts 15 seconds, how many images can you get with this camera? And here they were very close with the R5, again in zero, I managed around 240 images, whereas with the Z8 in the high efficiency star raw, I managed um, 225 images. And these numbers were always when writing on the CF Express card, expect the numbers to be much, much lower if you write on an SD card. So the next and very important topic is the autofocus. So first of all, both with both cameras, you can move the autofocus point or area basically all over the frame, really almost touching the edges, which is nice to have this big coverage compared to like DSLR cameras. Both offer also similar kind of modes or areas, like a, they're named a bit differently, but like a spot AF, single point, dynamic or AF expansion, um, different size and types of zones, and then uh, animal eye detection over the whole frame. Um, here you can also set if you want to have the animal detection over the whole frame or in the different zones, and this also offers this so-called 3D tracking. And finally, of course, the selection over the whole frame, and additionally, the Z8 also offers the 3D tracking mode. Both cameras also detect different subjects like people, um, vehicles, and of course, animals. The difference is that the Z8 can do this in these different zones in the whole area, whereas the R5 only can do it over the whole area. I think more interesting for now is how does the autofocus actually perform in the field? And here I need to say you feel that it's two really different systems. So for example, if I had a slow moving birds, swimming ducks, a bird being perched, no camera had any issue at all. They were performing very well. Overall, I had the feeling the Z8 tracking capabilities were a bit more consistent than the one of the R5. So if there were some flares in the picture, maybe some distracting elements, um, if I should backlit, the Z8 was sticking a bit better on the subject. On the other hand, I felt that the R5 was much better with subject recognition. So if I was shooting through some branches, um, through some leaves, or if I had a bird that was approaching me, was flying by, um, in front of a rather busy background and the bird was defocused, the R5 was much better at picking up the focus and the Z8 would often go on the background. And here I tried different mode and I felt like you need to switch the modes more often. I needed to more often manually change the focus, kind of pre-focus or use the focus preset where the R5 here was just more reliable. So overall, if you compare these two cameras to cameras we had like five years ago, they really play in a completely different league. Um, they both have their own strengths and weaknesses. Personally, I prefer the autofocus performance of the R5. I know that many of you also do the occasional video clips, maybe of some ducks cleaning their plumage, a bird taking off and so on. And here the Z8 is the clear winner for me. So for example, the R5 recording stops after 30 minutes, whereas here you can record unlimited. This is usually not a big deal outside in nature. I just notice it when I'm doing my YouTube videos that if a video is a bit longer, I need to actually get up and restart the video after 30 minutes. The R5 is also a bit more prone to overheating, even though I need to say since uh, I think mid-2022, whenever they released a firmware update where you could increase the, the point, the temperature when the camera shuts off, I didn't have any overheating problems anymore, I think. However, the Z8 should be a bit better here. But again, if you shoot just 4K 60 or 4K 120, 
I didn't have any problems in nature because in nature usually you don't shoot for half an hour or one hour usually it's short clips of one or two minutes and then you have a small break both cameras can shoot 8k i'm usually not doing this i just tried it quickly the z8 shoots 8k 60 frames per second this one only 30. what the mode i like most is actually 4k 120 because you can slow down the movements and you see more clearly how a bird is doing some actions and here the big difference for me is that the Z8 also records the sound. I know if I play something back in slow motion, I don't want to have sound, but usually I just record in slow motion and decide later if I actually want slow motion or play don't do the playback with the normal speed. And here the ability to just record the sound and decide later is much nicer on the Z8. I also prefer the interface or like the the information you have on the display like for example with this huge red um, square around the screen indicating that you're recording compared to the small symbol that you have on the R5. Um, newer cameras of Canon are already better in this. I would wish that Canon would release a firmware update for this but that's something else. And what is really noticeable um, is that the image stabilization at least with the new Nikkor lenses like the Z 600mm f4 is much better with the Z8. So for example, I could handheld video at 840 millimeters without any problem. Um, yeah, in photo mode, the difference is not so big, but you feel it when doing videos. And also the autofocus in video mode was almost better with the Z8 than with the R5, I would say. Another very important point to consider is of course the price. And we can feel here that the R5 is already three years old by now and the Z8 is much newer. Here, of course, it depends from country to country. For example, in Switzerland, the R5 is usually around 3,400, 3,500 francs, but you can often see offers for 3,000, whereas this costs around 4,500 francs. Usually the Euro pr price in Europe is quite similar. And then one very important message for you, don't forget about the lenses. The camera is just one piece of equipment and you will more likely update the camera in two or three years than you will update your lenses. So if you're starting out new or again, maybe you have a really old system and to, you want to move to mirrorless and you cannot decide between the two, okay, look a bit at these differences that the cameras offer, but also look if you have the lenses that you want. So for example, if you want to have a nice telephoto zoom that is rather inexpensive, still gives you like a nice background blur, then I think Nikon at the moment has the much better position with their newly released Z180 to 600 millimeter lens. On the other hand, Canon has some unique lenses like the 100 to 500 that I really like because it's so compact or the new RF 100 to 300 f2.8. So always check the overall system. I still hope that this video was helpful and if yes, please give it a like, subscribe to the channel and see you in the next video.